Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How to Start and Grow an IP Practice, presented by Nehal Madani. My name is Stephanie Phelan, I'm a Marketing Manager at MyCase, and I will be your host today. First, I'd like to give you a few tips about participating on GoToWebinar. The webinar control panel is on the right hand side of your screen. This is where you can control audio, chat with me, and submit questions. Please use this question pane to submit your questions at any time during the webinar. I'll be collecting those questions and saving them to ask Nehal at the end of his presentation, but please don't wait until the very end to shoot those over to me. Also note that these slides and the recording will be available by end of day tomorrow on the MyCase blog, and it will also be emailed to all registrants. When you close your webinar today, a very quick five question survey will pop up. All you have to do is answer those questions and you'll be entered to win a $100 Apple gift card. You have a great chance of winning, so it is definitely worth it. Also, if you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, the hashtag to use is hashtag IPLaw. This webinar has been approved by the Wyoming State Bar and the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE credit. If you are a Florida Bar member, note course 2461R to self-report your CLE. I'll also send this information out in the GoToWebinar chat pane. Today's webinar is hosted by MyCase, so before we jump into things, I'd like to give you a quick overview. MyCase is web-based law practice management software that takes care of your daily practice requirements for calendaring, contact management, document management and templates, time and billing, client communications, custom workflows, and more in one solution at an affordable price. My case is priced for solo and small firms, such as $39 a month per attorney and $20, $29 a month per paralegal or support staff. We also offer My Case websites for our customers. The one-time fee to set up and build your website is now only $500. And then there's a $50 per month maintenance fee. Note that this one-time fee of $500 to build your site will actually ex expire at the end of this month. So if you've looked into building a custom website, you'll know this is a super deal. We use modern professional design built for your firm. The websites contain social media and blog integration. And best of all, a client portal, which is completely integrated with your MyCase software. So now you and your customers can log into MyCase directly from your website. Next up is payments. Are you accepting payments from clients online yet? You should be, and it's easier than ever. MyCase recently announced the addition of a built-in credit card payments feature to our payment service. MyCase customers can now accept online payments from clients using both credit cards and checking accounts, also known as eCheck or ACH payments, seamlessly through their MyCase account, no third-party integration required. Last but not least, we enjoy hosting educational events for professionals in the legal industry, and that's why we're all here today. So let me tell you a little bit about our presenter. Nehal Madani is an attorney and the founder and CEO of Alt Legal. Alt Legal's IP software is used by law firms and in-house legal departments to prepare and docket thousands of IP filings every day. Before founding Alt Legal, Nahal practiced as an attorney at Kirkland and Ellis in New York City. He was selected for the 2016 Fast Case 50, an award that recognizes 50 of the smartest, most courageous innovators, techies, visionaries, and leaders in the law. I recently met Nahal at the Above the Law Conference in Philadelphia, where his company was highlighted as a top legal technology startup. When Nahal is not busy growing his company, he can be found on the streets of New York, photographing humans in their natural habitat. In other words, he's that guy who may have just taken your photo, but you're really not sure. Nahal's photography focuses on people doing everyday things and plans to turn this project into a photography blog, so stay tuned for that. Nahal, now that I have recognized your many talents, let's turn it over to you now. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you again, Stephanie, for the very kind introduction, and thank you everyone for being here today. What I want to share with you today are the insights that I've developed into starting an IP law practice through my work with Alt Legal. So, as far as agenda goes, we'll briefly talk about the various kinds of IP. 
before we talk into about the specific factors that you should consider in setting up IP practice. And we'll also cover the ethical issues that impact IP lawyers and some of those tools that are out there to alleviate some of those concerns. And so with that, let's get into introduction to IP here. Simply, IP matters more than it has ever before. It's quickly becoming a core part of every business and something that really every business should be protecting. IP filings around the world are at all-time highs. In fact, there's over 50 million active IP filings around the world today. And particularly with respect to patents, companies are being acquired just for the IP portfolio, and some companies are making very profitable revenue streams just from their patent licenses. At the same time, billions are spent litigating IP issues every year. And what, while all this generally has been historically true, what really excites me as someone in the ISP space is that we're seeing also an incredible surge in the number of small businesses and startups. More people, young college kids, successful executives are starting their own businesses today. And what all of this means is that there's going to be more IP to be filed, more IP to be litigated, more patents, more trademarks. And as an example, here is the growth in trademark applications over the years. And you see a steady increase during times of economic boom. But in 2016, we've already seen 13% more applications than the prior year. And a lot of this is certainly driven by economic activity, as I mentioned. But there's also this incredible jump in the national rate of new entrepreneurs. And all this is important because it creates new business opportunities for all of you. And so I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, so we're just going to cover very quickly three basic types of IP to consider here. Trademarks, they generally protect brands. There's no expiration as long as renewal dates and renewal requirements are maintained. And to prosecute patents, or to prosecute trademarks, you don't need any special legal requirements other than being licensed in one US jurisdiction at least. And the legal requirements to secure a trademark generally center around distinctiveness of the mark or any secondary meaning that is acquired. For patents, they protect machines, manufactured articles, processes, chemical compositions, and they do have a finite life, which is mentioned on the slide here. And the, really, the other part that distinguishes patents from trademarks is that you do need to be admitted to the patent bar to prosecute patents. And in order to be qualified to sit for the patent bar, you have a whole other set of requirements, a bachelor's degree in a recognized technical subject, or sufficient technical or scientific coursework or training. And a complete list of what's required is available on the USPTO website. And then lastly, there's copyrights. So these protect works of authorship that have been tangibly expressed in some sort of physical form, so very broad. And the expiration varies based on the type of work and authorship, but generally it's a longer expiration date. And again, the requirements here are just that you're licensed in at least one US jurisdiction. And so one of the other unique things that sets apart IP is that it's a national practice area. And you're going to start seeing more of a regional focus, so I'll talk into that. But before we do, I'd love to get a sense of how um, familiar this group is with intellectual property and how much of a part of your practice it is. So we're going to do a quick poll. And the question is, do you currently practice IP? And if so, in which areas? So I do not currently practice IP law. I currently practice just trademark law. I currently practice just patent law. And then the last option is a combination of both trademarks and patents. Great. So if everyone can please go ahead and vote um, in that poll there. And I will, looks like majority has voted, so I'll close the polls. Here goes. And the results are already in. Um, so do you currently practice IP? And if so, in what areas? 65% said, I do not currently practice IP law. 24% said, I currently practice trademark law. 3% practice patent law. And 8% practice a combination of those two. So the majority do not practice IP law. Great. Well, thank you for that background. It's very helpful, everyone. And as I was mentioning, IP is predominantly a national practice area, but what you're starting to see is more of a regional focus. So the USPTO itself has really emphasized 
being more available to entrepreneurs, being more available to attorneys. And so with that, they opened up regional offices under the America Invents Act. And probably no surprise here in terms of the locations that you're seeing on this map, but they're generally centered around areas of high entrepreneurial activity or strong engineering centers. So Silicon Valley, Denver, New York, all certainly make sense from that perspective. So with that background, let's go into what it takes to set up and grow an IP practice. So traditionally in many legal fields, you're going to see this divide between prosecution or transactional work and litigation. Now IP certainly has that divide as I've set up here, but that line doesn't always stay as clear cut. So the reason this is important is you want to start, when you're creating a new IP practice or you're looking to expand your IP practice, you want to identify the scope of it. So what areas of IP do you feel most comfortable with? Is it prosecution and filing new trademarks, new patents, new copyrights? Is it getting license agreements set up as part of that? Or do you feel more comfortable on the litigation side? And that's you know dealing with administrative courts like trademark trial and appeal board, patent trial and appeal board, or the federal court. And where this starts becoming blurry in terms of the divide is, let's say you are filing a trademark application, you're going to have the government that may oppose your application, third parties that may oppose your application, or third parties that may oppose your registration in the future. And so very quickly, something can go from transactional to prosecution based to the trademark trial and appeal board. And so it's important to figure out where you're going to be comfortable, and particularly for a solo or boutique practice. If you certainly can't handle all of this and there's a broad scope, it's important to ultimately develop a network of IP professionals who can help. And so we'll discuss this. And to compound all the complexity of what your IP practice may look like, it's important to also keep in mind that it's a global practice area. Your clients may be expanding globally, so you want to have that strong global network. And we'll talk about that in the coming slides. So let's talk about what's required in prosecuting intellectual property filing. So at the very first initial step, you have to gather some information from a client. You have to gather all the documents, so whether that's information about prior art, if you're filing a patent, or information about specimens, about how they're using their trademark, or what their future plans are for that business. Next, you're going to want to assess all that information and ultimately prepare applications based on it. And then you'll be filing it through government IP offices. And then ultimately, once it's filed, many attorneys do continue to monitor and update that IP filing, keeping track of key filing dates for clients. And then lastly, this is an optional service, but you also want to protect your client's IP rights through renewals and active monitoring of potential infringements. And that may require additional specialized software, but that's a great way to increase revenue in the future. So once you've identified the scope of your IP practice and you've identified what steps are required, you'll want to find a niche. And this is particularly true, and you've heard this probably elsewhere as well, if you're a solo or boutique, because as a solo or boutique, you have limited resources. And so what a niche practice area will allow you to do is effectively focus your limited resources and quickly build expertise and a strong client base because your outreach is going to be much more narrowly targeted. So how do you go about finding that niche? Well, consider your interest. Where are your passions today? What about your current client base? Are there any trends in your current client base or patterns that you can identify? Does your network consist largely of entrepreneurs in a particular category? What are your strengths and weaknesses? Most importantly, what is it that you enjoy? So I'll give you an example of one of our customers that's really I think, carved out a su successful niche in her practice. And what she does today is she helps nutritionists and entrepreneurs in the paleo diet space file trademarks. And so it's a hyper niche, but most of her practices really consist of that, and she's developed a great expertise around it. Under one of our clients today, leverages his network of Japanese companies and law firms 
that need to file trademarks in the U.S. And if you recall, one of those requirements here to prosecute trademarks in the U.S. is that you need to be licensed before the USPTO if you're not filing it yourself as the applicant or owner of the trademark. And so the other aspect of this that I alluded to earlier is that a strong IP network is critical. IP law is complex, and it's a global practice area. And so ultimately, when you start thinking about your IP practice, you want to be able to offer your clients a full-service IP offer. So that means if you're doing trademarks, you want to have a referral arrangement or of counsel arrangement with a patent attorney who can help your clients, and vice versa. And the same applies globally. So let's say you're a trademark attorney who's filed a trademark for your clients in the U.S., and now they want to go file, they want to expand their product line to Jamaica. You want an attorney who can help you navigate those local laws and processes there. So how do you go about building your IP network? So one option is being active on social media. And we'll send you we'll send you a list of key influencers that we found on Twitter and be able to you can engage with them and you can certainly be proactive there. The other is blogging, and I'm sure many of you have heard of this and may engage in this in your practice, but there's a few popular ones around IP law, likelihood of confusion, TTAB blog, everything trademarks, and IP watchdog. You can also become active in your bar associations, local and state, and there's several of them that are IP specific. So for example, if you're in New York, there's the New York Intellectual Property Law Association. And then there's also major trade organizations. So there's the International Trademark Association that's centered around trademark law, of course. American Intellectual Property Law Association, that's a little bit more oriented towards patents, but they still have great content for trademark practitioners. And the ABA, of course, has their own IP law section that hosts the annual meeting. And it's the ABA IPL. And just my personal favorite here is INTA. Um, it's admittedly, as I mentioned, more geared towards trademark filers, but it's a great collaborative community. And they organized an annual meeting, and last year they had 10,000 IP professionals from around the world attend. And if you're looking for an added incentive to attend this coming year, it's going to be held in Barcelona. So with that, I'd love to go through just some case studies from some of our customers and how they've built up their IP practice. And before we do that, I want to take a quick poll here and ask, what networking tools do you find to be most effective for your practice? Is it engaging on social media? Is it going to in-person events and conferences? Is it blogging, or is it something else? Perfect. Thanks, Neha. Um, so please go ahead and select your response for that poll. I'll give you just another moment. And okay, everyone's voting quite quickly, so I'll go ahead and close the polls and share our results. Okay, so what networking tool do you find to be the most effective? 15% said social media. 62% said in-person events and conferences, so definitely our majority. That actually surprises me a little bit. That's great. 4% blogging, and 9% said other. Is that about what you expected to see, Neha? You know, what did surprise me was, I guess, two parts. First was um, how dominant social media was. Um, we still don't see as much activity as we would like to see from lawyers on social media, but blogging was not as popular as I think it should be. Um, blogging is a very passive and easy way to get content out there. And it's one of those things that may not pay returns right away, but I think will pay returns in the future. As someone's searching for that content, your content's always going to be there. And when you're blogging, the key, I think in particular, is to go as niche in the content as possible. So drawing on our earlier example, if you can go blog about 
how paleo trade, diet trademarks are different from other types of trademarks and the special processes or thought processes that you employ to ensure those clients secure their trademark rights. That's kind of the niche content that when someone searches that, Google will be able to display your results as opposed to if you write something about how to file a patent. There's a lot of content already that you have to beat. Great. And so with that, I'd love to again just go through some of the case studies of how we've seen some of our more successful clients grow their IP practice very quickly. So I want to introduce you to Rena. Rena is a former corporate lawyer who set up their, her own law practice after a few years of just working at a big New York City law firm. And she started working in her earliest, I guess, stages of her law firm with emerging gross clients. And over time, they start transitioning from asking her on how to set up these contracts, how to set up their financing documents, to asking her for IP help. And so she was never um, qualified to sit for the patent bar, so she would refer that out. But over time, she wanted to start doing the trademark work for herself. And in the last couple of years, she has prosecuted over 60 trademarks for her clients. At approximately $800 a trademark, she's netted nearly $50,000 in new legal fees for her practice. And the way she was able to do this is, while she's not an IP lawyer by training, as I mentioned, she took the time to learn through CLEs like this one. And more importantly, um, I think most of the attendees find that networking is particularly useful for their practice. She developed a network of IP professionals by attending these conferences. And these attorneys started helping her through some of her initial filings. And the exchange share was whenever those trademark filings became more complicated, she would refer those out, particularly litigation issues. So through these conferences, she was able to develop an entire business and get connected to international colleagues who represent international clients that need trademarks in the US. And so, again, it's very easy, I think, to start building an IP law practice, so certainly be mindful of the pitfalls, because there's a lot of demand for IP work today. And so, again, ways that you can grow your practice, client networking is certainly key. Um, referrals from other attorneys, existing clients. Um, if you don't use newsletters, you use newsletters to keep your clients engaged, to make sure that you're top of mind. Online content, blogging as we discussed, social media. But there's a few other unique things that separate IP and allow you to grow your IP practice specifically. So unlike other legal transactions, IP isn't once and done. That means that it's not that you just file your trademark or your patent and you're done with it forever. There's always renewal dates that you have to be mindful of, objections from third parties, as I mentioned, or government offices. And so all that gives rise to are new engagement opportunities with your clients. So you can continuously reach out to them and give them updates on their trademark filings or their patent filings. And the best way i found to do that is to use some kind of docketing software that will automatically alert you of those new engagement points so you can easily maintain continuous contact with your clients. And the last one is certainly there's a lot of pro se applicants that file their own IP. And while they may not be qualified, they also have a high risk. Nearly one third of filings are filed by pro se applicants. And they may become subject to a proceeding whether from a third party or a government office that they may not be able to handle. So you could certainly engage them, but then of course you still have to be mindful of the model rules and specifically model rule 7.3. But all of these are different and unique ways to develop an IP law practice. And so if you have any questions about any of these strategies, happy to talk offline, and I'll be sure to provide my contact information at the end of our presentation here. So I want to get into some of the ethical obligations that are unique to IP practice. And some of this may be familiar to some of the experienced IP professionals on our webinar today, but there's specific things that are going to be involved in prosecuting IP, and a lot of it um, we find that even some of the experienced IP professionals are not aware of. So the USPTO has its own code of professional responsibility. 
And this generally follows the model rules of professional conduct. But I do want to highlight a few key provisions that relate to some of what we've already discussed. So first is competence. Now, normally competent representation just requires legal knowledge and skill. But if you note in that first bullet there, if you note in that first bullet there, it talks about having the scientific and technical knowledge required. And so that is where that patent requirement comes in. Sorry, um, I may have lost my, there we go. Um, that's where that patent requirement and the requirements for the patent bar certainly comes in. The second is unauthorized practice of law. And remember for patent prosecution, you still do need to be admitted to the patent bar. But more often, this becomes an issue when paralegals or support staff do what could be considered legal work. And so there are less obvious things here that come into play, like preparing a application or in responding to filing requests to change correspondent address, filing letters to abandon IP filings, authorizing amendments to USPTO examining attorneys. And these could all be considered the practice of law and should not be done by paralegals or support staff, essentially anyone who is not licensed to practice law. And the third is candor towards the USPTO. You can't make false statements. And in the coming slides, I'm going to highlight where this really comes in. There's one other point I want to highlight here, and you may have read about this trend, particularly um, attorneys in Florida should be certainly aware of it, because now there's a CLE requirement for technical competence that you have to comply with every year. But comment eight to the um, rules of professional conduct, specifically rule 1.1, says that attorneys now have to be keeping ahead of changes in law and practice as well as the benefits and risks of relevant technology. And so now, in addition to all the other obligations we have as attorneys, you need to make sure you're aware of all the technology that you could be using in your practice because there's a risk that a client could make a claim that a certain malpractice event would not have happened but for use of appropriate technology that is essentially best practices. And this has been adopted by a number of states. I think it's fact it's gone past 23 states since we last updated this. So let's talk about some specific errors for trademark applications here. I think the majority of attendees are trademark filers. And one of the things that comes in is US trademark applications have to be signed by a person that can legally bind the applicant or has first-hand knowledge of the facts asserted in the application. And so if your client is filing a trademark, there's a chance that you could sign the application, which is verifying that you have first-hand knowledge of the facts that are asserted in the application. And in some cases, you may not have that knowledge. And if you sign it and later there is a dispute, you could become a fact witness and potentially be disqualified from representing the client if that application is disputed or that registration is disputed. And so there's a very easy and effective way to avoid this. So if you are filing trademarks, take that extra step of sending the application to your client to execute. There is an inconvenience, it's certainly an extra thing to require your clients to do, but as lawyers we all want to minimize risk and this is a potential risk for you in the future. There's another more tangible example here that's an administrative error, and that is you want to be careful in the scope of how you protect your client's goods and services for a trademark. And so I'll walk through this example. There was a case where a medical device company claimed use of a mark in connection with stents. But when they filed that trademark, they weren't actually using it in connection with it. And someone else obviously wanted to use a similar mark, so they proceeded to seek cancellation of it. And they were able to do so because when that applicant had originally filed the trademark, they were not using it with stents. 
And the applicant later during the case tried to mend their application to remove stents, which they claimed were included because of an oversight. But the court ultimately found fraud. And the reason was it saw that the applicant had made a knowingly false statement to the USPTO to obtain registration. And the USPTO would not have issued it. And what the court here ultimately said is that fraud cannot be cured by deleting goods from registrations because you can imagine the policy ramifications of that where people would just file broad trademark applications for things that they were not using. And we talked a little bit about this late, earlier where you, after you file IP filings, there's constantly maintenance and deadlines. And what I want to show you here is that this is sort of a typical law firm prior to the advent and I think adoption of cloud-based software or just essentially moving towards paperless filings. And I want to show this picture to really highlight the importance of adopting good software for your IP practice, particularly if you do start doing more IP work one of the most mission critical elements is ensuring that you don't miss a deadline on behalf of your client. And of course, I think all the experienced IP lawyers will know, it's easy when you have 10, 20, 30 filings to track, but when you get into tens or hundreds of thousands of filings, it becomes much more complicated. And there was a case a few years ago where the USPTO has a disciplinary office called the Office of Involvement and Discipline and what they ended up doing is they bought an action against a solo patent attorney after he missed several filing deadlines for his client's patents. And what the attorney had been doing was relying on the office manager as well as a manual docketing system. And at first, it was literally a notebook that he kept with every entry and every date he had to file something. 2005 came along, he decided to then upgrade to Microsoft Office and started using a Word document that again listed the patent as a single entry and a date that a subsequent action was required. And what the court or what the disciplinary proceeding ultimately found here is that he relied on an unsound calendaring system. And even in fact, the attorney admitted that it was unsound. And I want to highlight this because they do expect that you do have your calendar dates, your calendaring in order, and even simply a spreadsheet or a calendar would have been much more acceptable to track these dates than simply a entry of all dates on a single line. And there was a much more, um, I guess, impactful case a few, almost a decade ago where there was a law firm, Fish and Eves, they're no longer around, and they missed a patent term extension filing for a pharmaceutical client's patent. And that client lost four and a half years of exclusivity, and because it was a pharmaceutical client, that totaled $2 billion in sales because the law firm didn't file a PTE application that would have extended the life of a patent because there were certain delays that were just beyond the applicant's control. In particular, here, the FDA process was just taking longer. And what ended up happening is a protracted, decade-long legal battle and a legislative battle that cost nearly $20 million to the company so that they could reverse this docketing error and restore the exclusivity period. And while they did ultimately restore it, it resulted in so much brand tarnishment for the company. And of course, the law firm, as I mentioned, is no longer active. So I want to pause here very quickly and just take a quick poll to get a sense of how our attendees are managing their deadlines. So what tools are you using or what tools do you depend on most to track deadlines? Is it Calendar Excel? Do you have professional docketing software? Do you use practice management software? Or do you not have any deadlines to track or just really is this not applicable to you right now? Thanks, Neha. Um, so please, everyone, go ahead and use that quick poll on your screen to select uh, one of those answers. And already, the majority has voted. So I'm going to close this, this poll and share our results. Okay, 
So what tool do you depend on most for tracking deadlines? The majority, 48% said Calendar or Excel, 11% say Docketing Software, 16% say Practice Management Software, and 24% say I don't have any deadlines to track. Let's go hide, hide those. Okay. Thank you everyone, that was very helpful. And um, we'll talk about some of the tools that you can certainly use. Um, I'm glad that most people are at least using Calendar or Excel in some capacity, but that certainly has a lot of manual upkeep. And so deadlines matter a lot. And particularly I want to emphasize that everyone have here the right tools of the trade for IP lawyers. And given the prior example here, I think one of the most important things that everyone who's doing IP should have is malpractice insurance. It's critical to have insurance to protect yourself and your practice, and it does tend to be costlier than other practice areas given the stakes, but again, if you miss that trademark filing date or if you miss that patent filing date, you're risking your client losing that IP right. And just given the value and importance of these IP rights, you want to make sure you're protected. Um, and one of the things that many malpractice carriers require is a docketing system. So docketing is just simply the process of tracking and managing your IP filings and dates. And as I mentioned, it's easy when you just have a few, but as you start managing more, it becomes much more cumbersome and just much more error prone. And so many malpractice carriers often require that you have two different kinds of docketing systems. So it doesn't have to be always software, but maybe one's a calendar that you update, one is a separate practice management system where you maintain it. And it does tend to be cumbersome, as I mentioned. As you have, again, many more trademark filings or patent filings, it does take up more time. So one of our customers, for example, used to manage her trademarks in a process she called manually Trademark Tuesdays. She and her law clerk would spend the first Tuesday of every month going through each of her 100 trademark filings, four hours each, and updating them and calculating all the filing deadlines. And so there's a number of docketing systems out there. Again, you can use something with practice management system. And of course, we're one of these docketing systems and there's a few others in the marketplace as well, like WebTMS. And when you do start thinking about your practice, it is important that you find something that will cover all of this practice areas that you're going to handle within IP. So is it international, is it trademarks, is it patents, is it litigation or prosecution as well. And like other legal software, you want to think about security as well as automation. And I want to go back to the client intake process as well earlier. Um, this is sort of process that we identified for doing IP work, but you're going to have this initial inquiry that's going to come in from an existing client or a new client. You're going to be assessing those IP needs, so essentially issue spotting. Then you're going to go back and you're going to collect specific information. You'll review it, you'll have several follow-ups, but this does tend to be a back and forth process with several documents and emails exchanged, and when you have that kind of tedious process, it does tend to be error prone, so we definitely recommend looking at some sort of standardized intake process. There's companies like Intake123 that can help you do that. And there's also specialized tools for IP intake. But from a client standpoint as well, you want to make it easy for your clients to give you this information. You want to present questions to them that are easy to understand, not overly technical. You want to leverage electronic forms or intake platforms like the ones I mentioned. You could even do an online survey. You could do a secure web link to collect all of that information. And again, given the stakes, it's essential that you keep records of this IP intake that you've collected. So if your client, for example, is trying to protect a logo trademark and something that they designed could be either seen as a circle or oval, you want to make sure that you have some record indicating that your client confirmed that it was a circle as you saw. And so this is where having electronic IP intake process can be helpful. And under tool of the trade here is let me just here, practice management software. So there's always going to be an administrative task associated with IP filings, and practice management software can help you organize your contacts, make sure you 
organize all of your matters and documents and ultimately potentially get paid faster. So particularly important for solos and boutique practices to identify those administrative bottlenecks and consider which elements are repetitive and which don't really require any substantive input and see if there is any technology solutions out there that can help. And related to IP as well as just generally in terms of evaluating tech vendors, again, go through your practice, identify the parts that are administrative, the parts that are repetitive, and then separate those from the parts that are substantive. The repetitive parts certainly can be handled by software. The administrative parts could be handled by assistant or potentially software as well. And you want to end up focusing as much as of your time as possible on the substantive. And there's a lot of technology out there, but you want to start thinking about what is it that you already use? So is it a Outlook calendar that you're already using to maintain your practice and find software that integrates with Microsoft Outlook? And I think most attorneys can attest to this, but we're all busy. And when you look for technology, you want to find one that's not going to require a tremendous learning curve, especially for ones that you're going to be using daily. You want something that just works and is just very easy to use. And you want to find a price point that works for your practice. And then lastly, because you're going to be dealing with mission critical data in terms of IP filings, you want to make sure that customer support and training is available to you. And many of the more modern cloud-based vendors will ensure that this is provided at no additional cost. And lastly, I want to go through just quickly some of the changes that are being proposed at the USPTO. And this is another thing that you want to be mindful of as you do IP work is to be receiving those alerts from the USPTO, signing up for those newsletters so you can be ahead of any changes. So for example, right now, one of the changes that the USPTO just approved is to the declaration of use portion of the trademark application is breaking apart each section and requiring each attorney and, or the applicant to agree to each section individually to increase accountability. And so it makes it harder to claim later that you don't have actual knowledge of the statements. And again, the easiest way to ensure that you're accurately certifying these statements is either sending it to the client to certify or having a comprehensive intake process that asks those clients to agree to each of those statements. And with that, I um, want to thank everyone for being here. And as a special thank you, we're happy to offer attendees discounts for our IP intake and docketing software. And you can sign up and get a discount just by going to altlegal.com slash mycaseweb and then emailing us that you participated in the webinar. And with that, I would love to take any questions. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Nehal. Um, those were some great tips. I know that we had a few people chatting over that this was very useful and they were happy to have the webinar. Um, so for those of you who have to leave us now before the questions, please take note of three things. When you close your webinar, a quick five question survey will pop up. All that it takes is answering those questions and you'll be entered to win that $100 Apple gift card so you can go get that new iPhone. Um, if you are a Florida Bar member, note CLE course 2461R to self-report your CLE. Also, you'll receive an email tomorrow with a link to the blog where you'll find these slides, the webinar recording, and the Apple gift card winner. All right, so now for some of those questions, which are still coming in. Um, please feel free to keep your questions coming in. We don't have a ton of questions, and Nahal has a bit of time. So shoot over your questions, and he'll answer them for you. But we do have a couple that we'll start out with. Okay, um, the malpractice insurance, there were a few questions on that. How, how much would you say is the average monthly cost for malpractice insurance, and do you have any more recommendations on that? I do have some recommendations. So if you email me, I'll be happy to provide those, and that's my email address. In terms of cost, I think it's really dependent on how long you've been practicing, whether you do trademarks, or whether you do trademarks and patents. Patents certainly have more liability to it. So unfortunately, I can't give it a good range because it's so fact specific. But if you do email me, I'm happy to provide recommendations for malpractice carriers. Okay, great. Um, 
And the next question is, can you expand on the difference between the IP software and the practice management software? It's a great question. Um, so when you think about practice management software, the way I see it in terms of the IP context is that it's essentially doing a lot of the tasks that you may task to assistant. So that's invoicing clients, recording time, organizing the documents. But when you think of IP software specifically, it's more what you would give to a IP paralegal. So for example, that's where you want software that will identify your trademark filings or patent filings, keep them updated, calculate your filing deadlines, essentially give you those IP reports that you need to send to your clients with all their portfolio holdings of IP. It's IP intake software that you could use to collect IP information. So it's much more oriented around some of the paralegal tasks and practice management software, I think, comes in more with the assistant level tasks, like, again, invoicing or documents or calendar or all of your contacts. Okay, great. Um, the next question, I'm a new attorney. I found that IP CLEs are not popular in my area. Where can we find CLEs concerning trademarks and copyright to increase competency? Um, on a great question. So what I would certainly recommend is going to web resources. There is Law Lines, that's a online CLE provider. Um, there's a few other ones that give out free CLEs. Solo Practice U may have some CLEs on IP. And we've also put together a lot of content on starting a new IP practice and specifically gaining that competency in trademarks and copyrights. So again, if you email us, um, Nehal at Obligal, we'll be happy to send that over here and direct you to some of the more specific IP CLEs we've found online as well. Okay, great. And the next question, um, what are the requirements for an IP license? So there is no specific IP license to practice IP law, I think that is the question, but to practice patent law, you do have to be admitted to the patent bar and in order to sit before to take the patent bar, you need a certain set of scientific requirements or background to even qualify to sit for that bar. But to practice trademark law or copyright law, you generally just have to be admitted in one jurisdiction. Okay, great. Thanks for that answer. And the questions are pouring in, so <laughs> I'm trying to keep up right great. now. Okay, good. Um, and your thoughts on starting a um, trademark and copyright practice right out of law school? I think it's a great idea to get started with it as early as you can. Um, one of the things I would suggest though is trying to find a mentor who can guide you into the process because the devil is always in the details. And so you want to make sure that you're not making a common mistake. You want to be mindful of any other ethical considerations beyond what we outlined. But use the internet, read blogs. We even have a podcast out there um, on starting a new IP practice where we just interview experienced trademark professionals and talk to them about how they got started and go into the weeds, so to speak, on specific trademark law. So it's a great way to get started with your practice. It's a great booming area of law and you can limit it to what you're really comfortable to. So you don't have to jump into deep end with some more complicated practice areas like securities law or tax law. You can get started with the basics and move your way to more of the nuanced areas of IP law. And the last point I'll mention here is that many businesses need IP protection. Some of them don't even know if they need it. So it's a potentially easier way to find clients. So certainly get started with it right out of law school and just be mindful of some of the pitfalls by getting to mentors and reading some of the content that are out there on IP law. Okay, good answer. Um, I've heard that it's very difficult to break into IP law unless you have a degree in a tech field. Is it equally true for patent law and trademark law? So that I think is certainly true for patent law because of that requirement to sit before the patent bar and you want to be able to have that understanding of some of the inventions that you're protecting. But for trademark law, there is no such requirement and I haven't found that to be the case. We've had 
clients who were sociology majors in undergrad, anthropology majors, economics majors, that just don't necessarily um, need that scientific requirement. It's really just more find an area of trademark law that you're particularly passionate about, find a particular set of trademarks that you're passionate about protecting. So for example, we have one client that, again, does cannabis trademarks and trying to get into the weeds of that area. So sometimes your non-tech background can actually be an asset because you can be more approachable to those clients in that specific area of law. Okay, that makes sense. That's a great answer. Thanks, Neil. Next question. Since the range of IP applications all must go to USPTO, I'm guessing that there's a national standard range of legal fees. Can you shed any light on what that might be? Sure. Um, most trademark work is done on a fixed fee basis because there's a good element of predictability to it. So you could identify the scope of the application and say, we're just going to file the application. I'm not going to handle office actions. Office actions may be an additional charge. And in terms of fee range, we've seen it really vary across the board. The lowest trademark fee we've seen any of our customers charge is $300 a month for a trademark application per class. And we've seen that go up to $1,000 or even $1,200 per trademark application. And so it does vary. And a lot of it is around how much time you're going to invest in the application. So to file a trademark, it's not just obviously filling out the paperwork for the trademark, but it's also potentially doing searches. So for example, if you're filing a trademark for all legal, you want to know, is there a trademark for alternative law out there? Or what other potentially infringing or trademarks that you could be infringing on out there? And it depends on the client. So if they just want a cursory internet and knockout search on the USPTO, you could do that very quickly. If they want you to order a search report and analyze every potential infringing trademark, that's going to be much more involved. So that's the other key factor in, I think, variability. But generally, the range goes from 300 to 1,200. OK, great. Um, and just want to encourage, we are getting through these questions quite quickly. So if the audience has any more questions, send them over to me again. I'm ready for those. Um, but we do have one more at this time. And the question is, what's a day in the life of an IP lawyer? I'm moving away from criminal bankruptcy, and I'm looking for exciting new work. Can you make a business, and this is kind of part two of that question, can you make a business out of solely working with startups? You can. Um, we have clients that have made very successful businesses. They're handling in their portfolio, I would say, even in just like just four or five years, they built up a portfolio of 500,000 trades. And so I think every day is a little different, but it's really helping new, new clients file new trademarks, existing clients file existing new trademarks as well, handling global expansions of their business, corresponding with global IP attorneys to help them get that protection abroad, um, counseling them on names, running searches, um, and Again, when you have that sort of adversarial situation, it's responding to government objections, it's responding to third party objections, and you could even build a practice where you do some of the prosecution work as well as some of that adversarial work where you have to go before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board or the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And I think, like any other practice, networking is always a key part of it. So going to those IP specific conferences as often as you can and um, building those connections. Excellent. Okay, we do have a couple more now. Uh, are there any um, other IP podcasts that you would recommend? I know, Nehal, you and I were talking about you do a few podcasts. Are there any you would recommend? Yes, um, we'll send out a link to ours as well. But the other podcast out there is IP Fridays. So it comes out every couple weeks. And IP Fridays is more global in scope, discusses both trademarks and patents. And so that's the other one that I'd recommend. And then, of course, like I said, we're a little bit more oriented in our podcast for trademarks. And Stephanie just sent over a link to ours in case you want to share that. And we'll send the link over for IP Fridays as well. And the website for IP Fridays, it's just ipfridays.com. So those are the two podcasts I'd recommend for IP lawyers. 
Great, sorry about that. And what do you think, um, this is another question for you, Nehal, what do you think about having a virtual office for IP practice? I don't think I need to rent office space and could possibly do this from home. What do you think? Um, great question. Um, we see a lot of our clients doing that. In fact, I'll give you a couple of, the, I think, more fun examples. One of our customers lives in Germany, and he set up a virtual practice that focuses only on trademark law with a San Francisco phone number and works strictly out of Germany. We have another one that does that out of Spain as well. We have an uh, IP lawyer based in Atlanta who flies back and forth between Atlanta and LA, keeping purely a virtual law practice, keeping overhead low. The only thing to keep in mind there is that certain states have started putting some onerous requirements that you have to have a physical address listed on your website where you can be found during working hours. I think New Jersey might be one of them, there might be a few others, but that's the only sort of onerous requirement. But most of the time, you have clients that you've never met in real life and people are okay with that because modern communication allows for that kind of ease of use and just ability to get the information that you need. You can even do web conferences with video chat, Skype, whatever it is that you need. And so there's a lot of companies that are just not tied to having a face-to-face -face meeting with their attorney. Yeah, that seems to definitely be the trend, I would agree. Um, okay, and the let's see, next question. I'm moving to a new state and refocusing my practice to trademark and copyright. Glad to know that I will not need to take a second bar exam, but do you recommend that I do anyways? Yeah, that's a tough question. So at the risk of, with the typical disclaimer of not giving legal advice, um, if you start interacting with clients in that state for work that isn't necessarily federal in scope, you may obviously be subject to those requirements. When you're doing federal work, I think you can certainly have a good chance of just being licensed in one state, but it's also, I don't know if certain states have different residency requirements that come into play, so that's just a state-specific issue you want to research. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Um, next question, how much time is spent in court in IP practice? You know, it's a good question and it really depends, going back to the earlier side, slide of how you define the scope of your practice. So we have clients that, if you don't like court, only do the transactional prosecution side and have attorneys that they refer out business to that do the more adversarial litigation kind of practice around trademark or patent law. And we have some that really drive on being in court or doing litigation work, and so they focus purely on IP litigation. So there's no requirement and there's no sort of average that I think happens. It's really how you define the scope of your practice, decide what you're comfortable with, and then refer out the rest. Because with IP, you're just gonna get referrals back and forth as you need, as you send business to others. Okay, great. Well, it looks like we are out of time. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. And Nehal, thank you so much for your presentation. And we'll be here again next month. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks, Nehal. Thank you everyone, take care. Thanks, bye-bye.